Now, people don't bring their Bibles because they know that they're going to see some scriptures put up on the screen and that's going to be it. We need to ask ourselves, is that adequate? Is that adequate? We need to ask ourselves, what do we do outside of our services as we recognize them? In particular, are we identifying those who are ready to do more to take on the scripture into their lives? Do we do enough with memorization? Memorization is fundamental to spiritual transformation. And I work with this all the time. Like in a retreat, I normally will ask the retreatants to memorize Colossians 3, 1 through 17. And I watch the effect, often to their own astonishment, of memorizing passages of Scripture. Are we doing enough with that? Do we have groups that are memorizing together? That's another very effective way. Uh, people often think they can't memorize, and they get into a group, and they find they can. Uh, anyone can memorize. Uh, and it's just a matter of working with the way that we go about it. Do we teach people to pray the word, the scripture? Many people don't know what to do when they pray. They, don't, they think they've got to say something, and they can't think up anything to say. And it's a great relief to them to teach them how to pray the scripture, to turn the scripture into a prayer. Uh, and that's one of the ways that we can use to bring the scripture into the lives of our people. Do we teach them to apply the word to what they are doing in their ordinary life? These are just a few things that I would mention practically at the end of this discussion. The big thing is for us to understand that we can change the minds of people by bringing the scripture into their lives and that that will transform their minds. So many of the well-known problems like pornography, they are solved simply by training the mind differently and they are hopeless if you don't retrain the mind. The people, people having problems with pornography or other things like that, they have their mind in the wrong place. And they must put it in the right place on God. And they must see people differently before they can simply step free of obsessions of all kinds. And the scripture will help us do that. And so it is the place of decision. Are we going to find the ways of using the scriptures in the personal life of those under our ministry that will lead to their transformation into Christ-likeness. Let me stop there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Willard. Thank you. Very stimulating. Great. Uh, let me just say this. We've got two microphones up here, and I would ask you to uh, make your way up uh, and ask your question, and we will rotate back and forth uh, as you're pondering your questions. Uh, let me maybe begin. Good. Uh, not a heavy question, but give us a little bit uh, further uh, autobiographical sketch. Uh, you, you, you talked about it a little bit, but how did you, uh, a philosopher, what your professional training is, but, but in your own life personally, and then how you got um, engaged publicly uh, uh, in the discussion of spiritual formation, uh, et cetera. That, that would be helpful. There are some very interesting issues there. Uh, let me say, I think the second part is shorter, so let me just reply that. Uh, I was a young Southern Baptist pastor, or, or at least I was trying. <laughs> and. After a while, I recognized that my most serious people were the ones who constantly came forward to rededicate themselves. Now, you know if you're a Baptist, you can't get saved again. 
So when you fail, you just rededicate yourself. <laughs> and I realized after a while that I was not saying anything that actually helped them change in the respects that were troubling them. And that is what made me begin to re-examine the New Testament and look at the teachings as well as the practices and the practices of Jesus. Uh, and it was then that I was able to begin to see more broadly what we have learned as Christians through the ages and to understand that some of these things that I had thought were merely the discarded practices of futile religion uh, were actually things that, if rightly used, would help people change. And so that's what led into that. Now, that took years uh, of understanding and growth. And then finally, I began to teach on this stuff and give series on it. And uh, Richard Foster was one of the people in the audiences, and so we worked on these things together some. And uh, so gradually that emerged in that way. Now, personally, uh, with memorization. Uh, so I'm going to get personal now, OK? <laughs> Uh, I, I used, when I used to travel to Europe or Africa, someplace like that, they'd practically have to scrape me off the plane. I suffered jet lag so badly that it took me days to recover. They just sort of had to put me in bed and come back a couple of days later. <laughs> and so one time, going from Kennedy to Johannesburg, the Lord said to me, fast, memorize scripture, and pray. And uh, so I took a passage of scripture, long passage, and memorized it, and prayed, and didn't eat. Uh, and I got off of that plane in Johannesburg as fresh as a daisy. Now see, that fits my, the way I describe a discipline is an activity in your power that enables you to do what you can't do by direct effort. And then I began to memorize more and more in the way of passages. And some of these, you know, you almost have memorized just from using them. Others you don't. But um, I think I mentioned that uh, in retreats, I in, ask people to memorize Colossians 3, 1 through 17. Uh, 1 Corinthians 13 is good. Uh, last uh, July, another Atlanta to Johannesburg trip. And uh, this was John 14. Uh, and so that's how I was led into it. Um, and I must say that, uh, I don't know, it just seems to me like it has made everything so much better and easier to do that. Thank you. Uh, is someone over here? Yes, please. Um, yeah, I appreciated uh, what you said about um, how the renewal of the mind could be effective in solving the problem with pornography. I was wondering if you could speak a little bit more about what that looks like and might be, how it might be um, The renewal used. of the mind? Yes. I'd be delighted to. Primarily two things. What's before your mind and how you think about it. Those two things are what need to be changed. Um, so, for example, uh, I'll go back to the case of pornography because that's so uh, important for us. All of us have to deal with that constantly. If God is before your mind, then everyone else, including yourself, that comes before your mind looks differently. Looks differently. So the main thing you're practicing is keeping God before your mind. And now you can learn how to do that. Frank Laubach has some wonderful writings, The Game with Minutes, about how you practice doing that. And let me just say, this is not law. This is wisdom. So if you have a hard time with any discipline, you haven't sinned. Right. Because disciplines are not laws. They're not righteousness. 
you're learning experimentally how to do things. Not everything that is wrong is a sin. Not everything that is bad is a sin. The book of Hebrews, you recall in chapter 7, distinguishes between the weights and the sins. And in disciplines, you're dealing with weights that get involved with sin. So then now, when I uh, am in a circumstance of any kind, like a, a circumstance in which I am um, in danger or uh, receiving some kind of treatment I don't think is right, my mind doesn't go to wh how I'm going to deal with that. My mind goes to God is in charge and is caring for me. Right? So where your mind goes is a matter of having a renewed mind. What your mind, what is before your mind is primarily also what happens in renewal. There are some things you don't even want to think. The worst things my grandmother could think of were shucks and tobacco. So no matter how bad things got, that's the worst thing she could say. Well, she was a person whose mind was filled with God. And so that's primarily what it means. Where does your mind stay? And how your mind works. What inferences you draw. Thank you. Those, that's the general pattern. And of course, memorization just transforms that. And you can learn that because when, the, when you memorize the passages, they, take, they settle in your body and in your soul and makes all the difference in the world. Thank you. That's a very good, important question. The hard questions are the good ones. So if there's something especially hard you think, don't worry about me. Just ask it. Yeah, please. Why don't you ask, please? And then, can I I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, I was intrigued by your definition, definition of the flesh and desire. Mm -hmm. And could you say more, a little bit more about your definition of the flesh as well as desire and I think about the Buddhist understanding of eliminating desire. Good, very good. Um, flesh is the natural powers of the human being. It's what you can do, relatively speaking, without God's direct assistance. So the classical illustration of the flesh is Abraham and Sarah and Abraham and Hagar in Galatians. And the idea that what Abraham and, Her and Hagar did in begetting Ishmael was not something that required the direct assistance of God. Therefore, it, he was a child of the flesh. And Isaac was a child of the spirit and the promise because he could not have been gotten just by Sarah and Abraham on their own. Now, uh, it is illustrative to understand here that Sarah and Abraham still had to do something, unlike Joseph and Mary. You understand, <laughs> understand what I'm saying? It's very important to, to see that because there is a part uh, for us. Now, perhaps in the very fine texture of the new birth, it's more like Mary and Joseph, perhaps. But uh, with the rest of our lives, it's we have a part uh, to play. Flesh is the general term for the natural abilities. Uh, again, a, a reference on this is Philippians 3, where Paul says, if anyone thinks they have right to glory in the flesh, I more. And what does he list after he says, I more? Well, I'm uh, born a uh, Jew, I'm circumcised, I'm tribe of Benjamin, uh, uh, I'm, in terms of the law, my exertions, I perfectly practiced it, and so on. And then he turns to, but now I despise all of that in order that I might 
know Christ.